God, we know that you have claimed each one of us as your beloved own. And we pray that your light would continue to shine on our world, particularly on each of those who are in need. For places that are torn by war around the globe, Ukraine and Palestine, we pray for peaceful paths for justice. Where the earth itself is crying out in flood and in drought, we pray for your mercy. We lift up in particular the people of Pakistan who have been contending with flooding all summer. We're mindful of the drought in so many parts of the world, leading to wildfires and people seeking refuge because of this climate change. We are also in the midst of this aware of people who stand up and aid one another in times of need. We think of how Tons of wheat have just been shipped from Ukraine in the midst of their conflict to drought-stricken parts of the world. We pray for more examples of your love to guide each of us into these kind of actions. Give us eyes to see what we are able to do in our own neighborhoods and communities. And give us the heart to put these ideas and these notions into practice. For all who 
who suffer in ways known and unknown, we ask for you to comfort them. As our children and students and teachers go back to school, we pray for their safety, for their expanded minds, we pray for all the support staff that makes education possible, all of those working behind the scenes in the cafeteria and on school buses and custodial services. For those who are looking for work, we pray that you would open the right door, that you would not allow anxiety to rise in the meantime. For those needing healing, we pray for your strength. We know that you are the great physician. And we pray that you would do the work of knitting us back together wherever we are broken, in our bodies or our minds, our spirits, our relationships. We ask that you continue to hear us now as we offer up more of our prayers for you. Holy One, we pray that you would pour out your peace amongst all nations. Heal this earth and expand the love in our hearts. Help us to know that you are already present with us now as you have been present with us in the past and will be in days to come. We thank you for the example of Jesus who shows us how to live on this earth and how to love you and one another. We pray now using the words that he taught us, saying, Abba God, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our God, we pray that these words that are spoken would be yours, that the words that we receive would be the ones that you need us to hear, so that we can fit our lives to your purposes. Amen. Friends, we are in the midst of a blockbuster series. <laughs> Beginning in August, when the movie houses start releasing all the movies that they couldn't, uh, get out of the, the, the studios during the rest of the year. Lots of times they send a lot of those films, be they blockbusters or duds, to the movies. And so in that spirit, we thought that we would dig into some parts of the Bible that we usually don't hear about on Sunday morning. So to that end, the book of Judges. And if this were a movie, we'd make clear this would be Quentin Tarantino, Jordan Peele, or more South Park than VeggieTales. <laughs> this morning, we hear maybe a bit more of the, the movie soundtrack, as it were, because it features in large part the song that Judge Deborah sang about the military conquest and victory of her people that she led them to over the Canaanites. The passage that we heard this morning begins with the phrase that recurs over and over again in the book of Judges. The Israelites again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And this pattern repeats over and over again in this book. The people stray away and they cry out to God for help. God sends a deliverer and they have a amazing military victory and then that hero becomes a judge who sits and uh, in, in, in rules over the people for a few decades until they die, and then the cycle repeats. This morning we hear about Judge Deborah 
And her song in particular features J.L. and the tent peg. I want to say, Judge Deborah is not Judge Judy. Just banish that from your mind. She is not some reality TV star. And if, if I'm going to take this movie metaphor a little further, if they were going to make a movie about her, think Viola Davis, Woman King. All right, are you with me? Because she's a judge, she's a warrior, she's, I mean, maybe with a little bit of Oprah thrown in there too, because people come to her for counsel. So she's the total package. These judges did not delegate. I'm reading their job, let us know, like, y'all need to delegate. We're accustomed to seeing men usually stand at the center of many biblical narratives. The culture was patriarchal, and they were typically leaders, both political and religious. But in this passage, when we hear Deborah introduced, the text goes out of its way to make clear over and over again, she's a woman and she's doing all these things. Will the Gap, the theologian, uh, talks about this, the, the string of feminine descriptors, the beginning of Judges chapter 4, verse 4, saying, Deborah was a woman, a female prophet, a fiery woman. She was judging Israel at the time. No other prophet really gets a description like this. I think she wanted to be that the, the text wants to make sure there's no mistake about what all Deborah was about. And again, the, the term judge that's used here kind of broadly denotes general governing. It can refer to administrative authority of kings, judges, chiefs. They were often responsible for the military. They resolved disputes. They advocated for the powerless. They made decisions. It was one-stop shop. And and as noted with the children, Judges chapter 4 and Judges chapter 5 talk about the same event, but they do so differently. Chapter 4 is prose, history, has a bit a different detail. Chapter 5 is the song, this poem that Deborah sings, it's a duet of Barak. It must have been quite the song. And, and most scholars feel like the song, the poem, is the older text, and that the prose came in later to kind of fill in the gaps. Um, and some think that this, this passage in Judges, the song, may be one of the oldest passages in the Hebrew Bible, just given the, the language that's used there. The song and the, the prose don't tell the story in exactly the same way. Not a surprise. We see this elsewhere in our scriptures. And in the song, we have more of a, a history of marginalized people, and their roles are lifted up in this national victory in ways that aren't really underscored in the prose passages in chapter 4. The theologian Walter Brueggemann has, has talked before about how often prophetic utterance is, is rather poetic in nature. And he says that poetry serves us well because it, it's... It, it's a, an elusive articulation that's not easily co-opted or, or countered by the dominant imagination. Because you can hear somebody's changed the lyrics to a song, right? Ah, that's not how it goes. I don't know how that verse goes. And so there was more certainty that the song would be sung in the same way over time. And this is not something that only happened in ancient uh, Israel. Catherine Dube Sackenfeld has written a piece about Deborah and Jael and, and, and Cicero's mother about reading our scriptures in cross-cultural contexts. And, and she talked about how uh, song and poetry can be used to empower oppressed people. And she talks about meeting Filipino women who spoke of songs that they sang in rural areas celebrating vigilante women who used guerrilla warfare tactics to challenge oppressive governments. She says that they sang these songs in secret and they never wrote them down. But they provided these women with a narrative of empowerment and hope that they carried amongst themselves and they shared with one another. This passage reminds us that there are often stories that we never hear. There are stories that we don't tell, or when they do tell them, we don't listen in very much. And Deborah, in her poem and in her history, tells some of these stories. Again, the book of Judges is this heroic age replete with weaklings who become warriors, cohort operators, and assassins, people with superhero strength and incredible, incredible odds that they come up against. Last week, Ehud, the left-handed assassin. Um, coming up next week, Gideon, stay tuned. 
He didn't just put Bibles in your hotel rooms. <laughs> <laughs> In the song, Deborah cast a vision of this epic battlefield narrative, and, and the apex of the poem actually happens outside of the battlefield, in the tent of a woman, and it, it talks about how God has come in to intervene, and the mountains have begun to tremble, and, and even the stars, sings Deborah, have come down from heaven to fight on their side. In some ways, it's helpful to have both the prose history and the song because they complement one another. They tell the same story in different ways, and each contains details and emphasis that the other lacks. And for the last 2,000 years, they've been read side by side. So this, this song that Deborah sings, it's full of blood and thunder, and, and that, that's why you have a manga comic in your bulletin this morning, because another way to read the Book of Judges would be through graphic novels, comics to those of us who are a little bit older. And, and so this sort of fits this book of Judges as well. And it ends Deborah's song with Sisera, the general's mother, waiting for her son to come home, not knowing that uh, jail has already eliminated that possibility. Deborah, unlike other prophets, doesn't have her own book, but she's given a prominent voice here in the book of Judges. Deborah's story that we hear this morning begins under the palms of Deborah, where she would sit and offer counsel and wisdom to the people of God between Ramah and Bethel, north of Jerusalem. And people would travel to her to settle their disputes and, and seek direction. And her name, Will the Gaffney points out, Deborah, consists of the consonants that mean she spoke in Hebrew. And she's described of a woman of, the text here says a woman of Lapidoth. Some say that means she's married to Mr. Lapidoth, but that also means fiery woman. So chances are, it's probably not referring to her husband, but more to the characteristics of her, because that's what everything else in that passage is doing in the description. So interpreters often have their own agendas as well. Her seat of judgment is pretty centrally located. People are traveling to hear her counsel. And in the Deuteronomic, Deuteronomic tradition, usually judges and priests were the same person. And so in this passage, they go out of their way to make clear that she is both, because she wouldn't have been eligible to be a priest as a woman. But they want to make clear that she is a prophet, she is a judge, and situated as she is between these two cities of Bethel and Ramah, it's an alternative to the priesthood, which in the book of Judges, was pretty corrupt. And so she's in this midway point providing an alternative to the existing power structures, and then she becomes that power structure as the judge of Israel. It says that the word of the Lord came to Deborah, and so she summoned the military leaders to her to share God's command. It says she called Barak to the palm tree and told him that she wanted him to take their soldiers to defeat the Canaanite forces who were being led by a general named Sisera. And Barak said he would do it, but he'd feel a whole lot better if Deborah came with him. And she said, all right, all right, I'll come along with you. But she said, I'm gonna warn you, when we win, and we will, the victory is all gonna go to a woman, not you, Barak. And he's like, that's fine, that's fine, so long as we win. Barak didn't have a lot of ego. <laughs> and so, there she is, both a military strategist and a warrior, and it also says that she is described as a mother of Israel. And these aren't oppositional. She provided security for all the people under her care. And it suggests also in the song that she sang that she, she addressed economic injustice. And it says that under before her rule, there uh, was inequitable distribution. That some, the, the, the mighty grew mightier and the lean grew really lean. And it says that under her rule, there was more equitable distribution of resources. And in the song, she definitely takes credit for what she does, but she also lifts up others, like her predecessors, who were also judges in Israel, and her comrade in arms, Barak, and Jael, who ultimately delivers Israel. So Barak and Deborah go to battle, 10,000 soldiers. And it says that God throws the Canaanites into a panic and they were defeated in a bloodbath. 
But Sisera escapes with his life. He flees on foot to the camp of a man named Haber. And he, he thinks that Haber is an ally and is going to protect him. But Haber is not home. Haber's wife is home, <laughs> jail. And the story starts to fit into place. And so if, if, if Judge Deborah is Viola Davis, woman king, this is where it all starts to go kind of film noir. All right? Thin the tail. Thin the towel? I'm going to speak French. Thank you. And so, so she says to Sisera, he says, Hi, you know, can I come in? And she speaks to him reassuringly. He's exhausted from battle. And she says, come on in, come in, don't be afraid. And this is where Jael stakes her claim. Oh. Yeah. That, that, that's for you Bible drillers who read ahead. Thanks very much. Um, she makes a good point. <laughs> All right. Really bad. So, thanks. Thank you. She, Sisera accepts her invitation, comes into her tent. And now this is where the people who had heard this for the first time, their eyebrows would be hitting their hairline. Because married nomadic women at that time had their own tents. And these were strictly female spaces. They were off limits to men, except for um, when they were knowing one another biblically. And so men would not have gone into a woman's tent, especially if it was not his wife. And so inviting a strange man into her tent is scandalous, and frankly, it's kind of dangerous for jail. And most people listening to this story would have been afraid for her. And so we know that violence against women has often been a tool of warfare. And we are reminded of this in the song that Deborah sings in chapter 5. But here we hear about, about Jael. She fulfills Deborah's prophecy, but she confounds a lot of other expectations. Um, it says in chapter 4, once inside the tent, again, chapter 4, chapter 5, at this point, tell the story differently. Uh, in chapter 4, it says that once inside the tent, she hides Sisera under a blanket. He asks for water, and she gives him milk. He says, stand at the opening to the tent, and if it, if anyone comes in and says, is there a man here, just say no. And so he falls asleep from exhaustion, and she takes the tools at hand, a tent peg, and a hammer, and drives them through his temple. This is why we don't preach this on Sunday morning. <laughs> when Brock arrives in pursuit of General Sisera, she goes out to greet him and says, come, and I'll show you what you're looking for. I'm telling you, the book of Judges is full of one-liners, like... Can't believe. And so he went in with her and he saw Sisera lying dead. Jael is praised throughout the book of Judges, chapter 4, chapter 5, even though ostensibly she pretty strongly violated the codes of hospitality, right? Normally when you invite someone in, you give them someone's sleeves, something to eat. This isn't how you dispatch them. And it seems here, though, clearly that this, the book of Judges is far more concerned with Israel's deliverance, not with compliance to laws of hospitality at this point. And some scholars have even suggested that it was Sisera more than Jael who broke the customs of hospitality. Sisera's death, the passage makes clear, marks a turning point in the fortunes of Israel. Now Israel, it says, has the upper hand. Instead of being on the defensive, now they're on the offensive, and the Canaanites are on the run. And more than once in chapter 5 in Deborah's song, she refers to Jael as the most blessed amongst women. And you're thinking, I've never heard of her before, some of you have, but many of us probably hadn't heard of her before. For the job she had done, she's remembered as a great hero and a patriot. And what we say, well, I thought we weren't supposed to glamorize for her and violence. And where is God in a story like this? Again, I would lift up some of the differences that we see in these two accounts of this story. The first major difference in chapter 5 is that Jael does not invite Sisera into her tent. And it says in chapter 4 that she drives the tent peg into his head while he's fast asleep. But in chapter 5, he's wide awake. He's wide awake, wide awake, and it says that he fell and landed between her feet. In the song's account, 
She doesn't kill a passive and tired warrior. Instead, she strikes him while he is standing and fully awake. The end of Deborah's song is rather stark as well. It concludes with the image of Sisera's mother staring through the lattice of her window, wondering when her son is going to finally come home. And this, the narrator juxtaposes these heroic actions of this tent-dwelling woman, Jael, with the mother of an aristocrat who stands behind that lattice of the palace and wait. So this is, again, class and power, because Cicero's mother has a home that has windows, and all these other folks live in nomadic tents. Cicero's mother uses, in chapter 5, verses 27, where her son is, and says, aren't they perhaps just finding and dividing the spoil? Woman flesh, one or two for each soldier. Silks for me to wear when he comes back home. In her musings, she reduces these captive women just to their body parts. Darren Guest has said that Judges 5 deliberately contrasts Sisera's fate with the expectation of his mother waiting for his return. And the crudeness of the language here has long been noticed. So even though we find it unpalatable, this jars strongly with the fact that this woman, we would assume is an aristocrat, has a pedigree, is thinking in pretty crude terms about what's happening on the battlefield. Cicero's mother's reference to human spoil parallels, in fact, what is happening between Jael and her son. And many feel that through her action, Jael prevented the assault of many women in her clan. So this is a pretty horrific account, whether it's in prose or in poetry, however you receive it. And it's not the only instance of how people in wartime get medals for doing what in peacetime would get them thrown in jail. So how do we hear these texts and stories today? There's a, a, a prison chaplain named Sarah Joby, and she read these chapters with the women that she worked with in her prison as a chaplain. And she said she'd been working as a chaplain in this prison for more than a year before she realized that almost every woman that she met who was doing time for murder in that prison had killed an intimate partner who had been abusing her for years. Some were serving four-year sentences, others 15 to 20. Others were in prison for life. She said two of her congregants began their incarcerations on death row, having been given death sentences for killing men who had actively tried to kill them first. And she says she describes feeling shock and confusion and anger when learning that these situations were not considered self-defense. Law professor Victor Stride said that 53% of the women on death row in the U.S. in the year 2000 were there for killing abusive partners. Many more served life sentences, often with the stories of their past abuse never having gone on record. This wasn't always the case. Um, until the 1970s, battered women who killed their abusers were often acquitted on grounds of self-defense or insanity. But as the rising rate of incarceration dovetailed with the wave of publicity surrounding the prevalence of domestic abuse, prosecution of these, these crimes started to shift. Public awareness led to a kind of sickening irony. They said, well, if these women had agency enough to kill their partners, then they could have gotten away from the abuse. And since they didn't, they should be punished to the full extent of the law. And women who ultimately kill their abusers have learned from years of experience that they're often no match for their partners. They often are smaller physically, and they have found that men can use their hands and feet often to harm their partners, but often when women are defending themselves against these attacks, they need to use a weapon. And the courts repeatedly rule that the use of a weapon disqualifies them from invoking self-defense. And they also say, well, the threat wasn't that imminent. It wasn't that imminent. It wasn't an immediate threat. You could have gotten out of the situation. 
And they said they could have escaped, that lethal force wasn't the only option. But we find over and again that women often kill their abusers when they're asleep or incapacitated or in a temporary lull between violent acts. Cynthia Gillespie has noted that even something as simple as a door in the room in which an attack occurs has been used to argue that a woman should have escaped and therefore her use of force isn't self-defense. You know, scripture is here to help us make sense of our lives, particularly when it seems utterly senseless. And here we have an example in the text of a woman who killed a violent man in exactly the same patterns in which abused women today fight back against their abusers. J.L. kills Sisera in her home while he's asleep and used a weapon. But in this passage, she's lauded for it. Hear me now, I'm not advocating for more. Please just back up and hear the message of the story. All right, I just need to be clear. But Chaplain Joby offered this interpretation of J.L to this group of women in prison. And the circle of 25 women were in this double-wide trailer that was their classroom and their chapel, and a woman had just shared her personal account of how she had come to be in there. And it was a story that was familiar to many of them. And then they opened their Bible to this passage. And they hear about this violence where Sisera had, and his, had cruelly oppressed Israel for 20 years, such that Israel cried out for help and then the story cuts to the courtroom drama involving Judge Deborah, where she calls for military leader Barak and says, God will deliver them into Barak's hand. Barak asks for Deborah to join in the fight, and she says, I will go with you. They go into battle, desperate for those 20 years of oppression to end. And as Deborah stands to fight back against the odds, it says that Sisera's army is routed. And they all fall by the sword, except for Sisera himself, the most powerful one, slips away to his would-be ally. When Jael gives him something to drink and covers him up, he says she picked up that tent peg and went to him quietly. The scripture says that when this happened, God subdued Israel's enemy. She does not do what is expected of her. She violates hospitality. She violates her husband's alliances. She violates expected gender roles. She's one of the few women in scripture to kill anyone at all. She holds her own counsel. And by her act, it says that Israel grew strong. Again, her crime in our courts today would have her primed to be convicted of first degree murder. She, her victim was asleep. She had access to a doorway. She used a weapon. And some suggest that she may have even given him uh, uh, something to make him fall asleep. Warm milk? Who drinks warm milk? Yeah, nobody, but if you do, it's supposed to make you go to sleep. And so, um, and it, it suggests that, that this, this use of deadly force is not proportionate because as yet he has not acted in force directly against her. But instead of condemning her, scripture tells her story a second time, and this time as an epic poem. It's as if the text knows that she will be open to misinterpretation, and they want to be really explicit. What she did is worth thinking about. Most blessed of women is Jael, wife of Hagar the Kenite, most blessed of tent dwelling women. When Chaplain Joby proclaimed that in that double wide trailer with those inmates, most blessed is J.L., she said the room just went silent. And the silence just went on and on until one woman after another, a woman who was also a lifer for killing an abusive partner, sighed aloud and said, this world would be a lot different if people called us blessed. Jail, in this way, satisfies a hunger for biblical models of women who keep their own counsel and act for their own safety and that of their kin. The chaplain makes a point that by lifting up Jail as a hero never led to a single woman in her congregation in that prison considering herself a hero. But she said, graciously and miraculously, eased the deep shame that those women carry for having chosen their own lives over the life 
of someone else. And her heroism, that of jail, enhanced their own humanity. These passages are hard to read. They're hard to sit with because nothing is this or that. There's a whole lot of gray in between. And these chapters four and five work through what some theologians call pre-telling or telling and retelling the story because we are prepared for what's about to happen. Because we had these hints dropped all along. Sure, Barack, we'll have victory, but it's not going to be by your hand. It's going to be by someone else. A woman's going to do this. And to predict something is to say it in advance. And saying something like that doesn't need prophetic skill because battered women defending themselves against their abusers can be predicted in advance because it has continued to happen again and again with the same risk factors for centuries. Jail's story isn't only talked about before it happens, it's also retold after the fact. Deborah and Barack join together singing her song and in singing it, they offer an interpretation that every life is precious, every death is to be mourned. But if anyone continues to flout such truth, God will fight for them for the safety of God's people, through government, through stars in the heavens, and through tent-dwelling women, housewives like J.O. And we are people who love to celebrate God working through the underdog. But we aren't very well practiced at telling a story when the underdog is a woman fighting a violent person in her own home by whatever means are available to her. If we take Deborah as an example for our own speech, if we were to take scripture at its word and call her a blessed woman, who else might we begin to proclaim as blessed? Many of the heroes of Judges represent those who are in some manner marginal, and often they come for a moment to the center only to be returned again to the margins when the job is done. Ehud, the left-handed assassin, Gideon, who was afraid and hid and saw himself as weak, Samson, who was deeply flawed and whose greatest act came when he was a blind prisoner in a foreign land. All of them, though, were empowered by God to stand against their enemies and bring freedom to God's people who were suffering. These are reminders that God works in our midst in ways that we would not anticipate. But as noted in the past weeks, this cycle of saviors left Israel wanting more, a more lasting deliverance. It's exhausting to go through this over and over again. Deborah may be unique amongst the judges regarding her gender, observes Will the Gaffney, but she is certainly exceptional more so because of her character. That's what makes her exceptional. She's the only judge that the text casts in an unequivocally positive light, in addition to being the only judge already in divine service before being called up for military action. Each judge who succeeded her represented a decline in quality and character. Her narrative epitaph is found in a single line of prose at the end of the song, saying, because of her, the land had rest for 40 years. But I want us to look at what Deborah did. She used her power and her position to lift up others, to give voice to others who wouldn't have it, to give opportunities to others who wouldn't have it. So what does deliverance and salvation look for us, look like for us? How do we, who do we proclaim as blessed? Whose song is being heard? Whose would we rather turn the volume down on? In the spirit of Deborah, whose security and freedom will you fight to defend? Whose song will you sing? We are called to lift up God's people and to lift up our voices. And in so doing, may the stars of heaven join alongside us.